Okay, guys, this will be our last DDU Viva practice. The exam is uh, in the written exam is in seven days' time, and then the Vivas are on the Saturday morning. Um, I, I guess as, as we go into this, I'll repeat a little bit of what, what I've already said a couple of times. So this is a very clinically orientated exam. Each uh, it will be quite clear. Uh, hopefully, the exam is, is quite clear. There is nothing there to trick you. The lion's share is echocardiography. There will be some general ultrasound in there. Um, the clinical stem is very relevant to the question. It's meant to be quite simple. Uh, it's obviously not a, a clinical exam, but definitely you are expected to be clinicians. You know, if I give you a clinical stem and I tell someone uh, and I give you someone's an IVDU, you know, that's going to be relevant to the question, obviously. Um, and I guess what we're trying to test in the exam, similar to the, the F. Sikkim exam, is that we're expecting you to do the basics extremely well. You know, I, I'm not going to give you a core tray atrium, right? I'm not going to give you something that's super hard. There will be some challenging cases in there because we've got to try and figure out who the best is amongst you who's going to get the prize. Um, but if there's... Uh, if there's something in there, you know, that's, that's not quite there, don't, don't, don't get too downhearted. As I said, we've got to have some challenging bits in there. The last thing to say is um, if we speed you up, that there's, a, there's a time limit uh, that we have, which is 40 minutes for the whole exam. We will give you seven or eight questions. That means there's about, you know, between five to seven minutes per question. Uh, sometimes some of them a bit quicker, some are a bit longer. We have very strict time limits when we're going through those vivas. So uh, if you've got the examiner speeding you up, again, don't be disheartened. It's about that we have to try and hit those marks because every single candidate has to do every single question. Um, so that will flip it back to the last thing to say that some, some people speak slower than others. Just, again, don't let the examiner push you too hard, but it's... Um, you know, just make sure that when you're speaking, you're efficient, you sound confident, avoid the ers and ums, and, um, you know, say what you see. I, I have an absolute no doubt that your clinical knowledge is there for everyone who I'm, I'm seeing on here. Your clinical knowledge is in there. If anything's going to trip you up, it's just going to be the exam technique. And so just try and, you know, practice those, those ways with, uh, which we've gone through already, which are about trying to get through things in an efficient manner. Okay. So why don't we kick off? And normally we're going to kick off these exams with some point and shoot questions. Sid, as always, you're the first to log on, so you're at the top of the screen, so you get to go first. Uh, what's this image and what does it tell you? This is a um, this is a mediesophageal view sh um, showing the left atrial appendage um, in flow velocity or the velocities, um, and the velocities, the peak velocities are in the range of uh, varying between 20 to 60 um, uh, centimeters per second, uh, trying to demonstrate the, the appropriate velocities uh, of the blood flow across the left atrial appendage. How about if I was going to tell you this is not the left atrial appendage? And you're, you're, you're probably right looking at the image at the top, but if it's not the left atrial appendage, what else is it? And again, have a look at the doctor mm -hmm. profile. Pulmonary vein? Yeah, nice. Uh, so which pulmonary vein would it be at 50 degrees, do you think? Left upper pulmonary vein. Or left lower pulmonary vein. Yep. So I think normally you see the upper at about 110. Cool. Yep. So you still pass that. But that what they're in the marking grid, that would probably be put down as a prompt, right? And so when we're marking the uh, when we're marking the 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 candidates we have you as you know fail borderline pass pass borderline uh, sorry pass pass well so if we have to give multiple prompts that kind of moves people from like you know pass well to a pass depending on prompts and stuff so again if the examiner has to prompt you don't freak out it certainly doesn't mean you failed the exam uh but it does sort of mean that you've got to just try and you know avoid them if you can cool so what is uh this is the left lower pulmonary vein. What does that trace show you? Again, this is showing the inflow velocities across the left pulmonary vein. Um, yeah. The velocity is um, in the range of same 20 to 60 centimeters per second, which is showing the appropriate velocities. 
So what about the flows? What about these flows down here? Does this look like a normal pulmonary vein flow profile? Oh, I see. I see what it means. This is the systolic flow, but still across the pulmonary vein. Good man. Which indicates? Um, either se severe mitral regurgitation, or it could be a um, index of raised left atrial filling pressures. Very nice indeed. Ravi, you are next. Can you critically appraise these profiles? And I'll tell you that these profiles are in the RVOT in the short axis. Sorry, the image is a bit rubbish at the top. So RVOT short axis, that's the pulse wave Doppler. So first thing is the four uh, sweep speed is 67. So uh, sweep speed uh, should have been 100 mm -hmm. nice. uh, to get at least three uh, traces in a frame. The baseline could have been higher nice. to get the maximum uh, image on the view. And the uh, velocities uh, could be reduced so that the entire frame is filled up with the uh, image, uh, image in question. Very nice. Um, excellent. And tell me about what you think about these measurements of that. So I've given you an acceleration time of 160 milliseconds. Yeah, so that is uh, normal, more than 120 is normal. Yeah. Do you trust and, it? Uh, Do you trust it? Are, uh, I can't see the Doppler angle, so always uh, the Doppler angle will be in question. But if at all it underestimates the velocities, yeah, cool. So uh, the velocity will be uh, uh, more uh, like the, yeah, it will be more than uh, this if at all. Yeah. And the R RVOT VTI is uh, 0.27 meters. So uh, it's more than uh, 0.16. So good job, right. very, very nicely done. Um, maybe it's a little bit of a dodgy question as well. What I was trying to get at here is what I've used here on the Siemens machine, the SC2000 that we used to have is it does automatic um you know, automatic number generation things and it traces this for me i thought one of the bits that probably i'd prompt you with if we had a bit more time is trying to get the doppler profile what do you think about the doppler profile i, I mean i asked you to critically analyze it and you told me everything we needed to do to make it a better doppler picture but what do you think about the sort of profile in here what do you think that tells you so for a pulse wave doppler it has to have more uh, clear uh, model velocities yeah, fair enough. Yeah, so again, dodgy imaging. Sorry about that. What about the profile? Do you think, because I mean, I, I thought it had that kind of notching in there. I thought it had the, the notch in there. So what does the notch indicate for you? And again, it's not perfect. You're probably trying to do better in the exam, but you get the, you get the uh, idea. Yeah, flying W signs, so yeah. it indicates increased uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. Yeah, but we've only got pulmonary acceleration times here of 157 milliseconds. You said that was normal. Silly, but... So that's uh, uh, probably the uh, they have not placed the marker, so the, there must be a measurement error there. Yeah, nice. And I think the machine's obviously not trained to pick up the the fact that there's a flying W sign in there. I think they're missing out the the whole importance of this Doppler profile, which we've got a flying W sign of raised pulmonary vascular resistance and I think to have a normal acceleration time with a flying W sign is something I've never seen. So again, it's the, just having the nows to say, I don't, I don't trust these numbers. They, they look a bit strange. They're not, uh, they're not sort of tracing the, the right things there. So yeah, not bad. Uh, ben, um, so again, tell me what these images are and what they tell you. And let's just start with the image in the top left, please. Yeah, it's good. Move my uh, thingy. You don't start off the exam like that, right? No, I won't. But hopefully, I won't have a screen of five people looking at me. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. It'll be much worse. <laughs> Good. Um, so, uh, transesophageal echo. Uh, looking at the interventricular septum. 
what did you what would you ask sorry i was just distracted by the pictures what, what are what are these images and what do they tell you yeah sure so uh, this is a transsubjectal echo looking at the interventric of the septum uh, what i can see in this study uh, across the two pictures is either the presence of contrast if there's been given an ultra enhancing agent um, or uh, increased gain or even spontaneous echo contrast and the, the left image on the screen. Yeah, forgive me. This is again one of these uh, one of the artifacts that the SC two thousand generates actually generates yeah. when even though we have normal flows, you can often see this smoky appearance. So I'll ask you just to ignore the smoking appearance in it. Uh, there okay. is no spontaneous echo contrast. There is no contrast agents being given. That's just a normal flow and a normal thing that happens with the SC two thousand Siemens machine. So just right. focus more on like the two D side of things. Oh yeah, okay, no worries. All right, so yeah, so interatrial septum. Uh, it does not appear to be bulging in one direction or the other. It appears relatively straight or perhaps bulging a little into the right, but it's not aneurysmal. Uh, on the colour Doppler picture to the right, uh, there's the presence of colour flow across the interatrial septum uh, from left to right. So do you want to rethink that idea that the interatrial septum is not bowed one way or the other? So it does, the fact that it's flow from left to right suggests that the LA pressure, or it means the LA pressure is higher than the RA pressure. So you can get some bowing there. Yeah. And uh, anything else that you can see? So if there's flow going from left to right, what about on the left? Uh, is there anything that you can see there that would be the cause of this? So there appears to be a defect in the interior, except in the color Doppler. Um, associated with the uh, where I would expect there to be uh, atrial septal defect, a sequindum atrial septal defect probably. Um, I would not expect there to be uh, right, I would not expect there to be left to right flow uh, in the setting of a PFO. And I think there's a little bit of stem uh, attached to the uh, aortic valve root suggesting it's not a primum ASD. Okay, okay. What about the bottom image? What are we doing there and why? Just moving it around. So there we go. So here we're doing a, we've got a uh, bicable view performing a bubble study. I'm assuming it's not the contrast thing. It, and that is the absolute, sorry, that is the bubble study. Sorry, I was bringing the top left when I said no contrast agents. Yeah, gotcha. The okay. bottom one absolutely is a bubble study. Yeah, so performing a bubble study, looking for right to left flow, um, ideally in the setting of having raised right side of pressures from having someone balsalva or cough. Uh, just watching it cycle through. I can't see bubbles going from right to left in this study, suggesting that there's not a right to left shunt. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Are there some bubbles? Yeah, so I think you'd have probably got a couple of prompts in there, Ben, I'm afraid. So yeah. again, for me, the, this, um, so if I'm asking you what those images are, give, give me first up just that it's a toe. I know it's fairly <coughs> obvious and you, you jumped to yeah, right. it. I think, I, I know I say don't go through all the basics, but if I'm if I'm not telling you, just give the examiner that you know it's a toe. And I think maybe I'm being a bit facetious there again. But for me, each image in turn tells you something, something is important. And for me, the top left image shows you that we've got a patent frame and ovale there. It's not an ASD because you've got the big overlap between the two yeah. things. You know, I think yeah. uh, a secundum, you've got a big old gap. You know, you don't have a secundum with the with the septum, sort of the septum secundum coming in. I mean, that's the whole point that it's missing. And mm -hmm. so you get that big hole. So if you've got any kind of overlap in there, it's got to be a patent frame and ovale. And so the yeah. big finding for me on the left is that I think the septum is pushed over to the right a little bit. We've mm -hmm. got a clear sort of defect that's sitting there in between the two um, yep. two layers of the prime and the secundum and and that's going to point us towards the suggestion that this is a patent frame in ovale yeah the next thing we've got to try and determine is the shunt yes so that's where the color stuff on the right comes from and we can clearly see that there's this there's color in that filling defect and then you've mm -hmm. got that left to right shunt that you picked up so the final one at the bottom is that the bubble study, you absolutely talk about the right to left shunt. There's no right to left shunt, but I think we can see a left yeah. right shunt. And there's a bloody great color Doppler signal there to sort of try and prove it. And we pick that up. How do we pick up the, the left to right shunt on a bubble study? You have 
negative or well, negative contrast. Yeah, like perfect. That. So in the, in when we're doing the marking grids for the vivas, you know, we've got to try and make sure it's you know it's, you've got the same examiners doing it across two different locations, which means that we've got to make sure we're marking it in the same way, which means that we've got buzzwords that you've got to say. Then obviously we try and there's a bit of leeway in there, obviously, but we there's, there are kind of buzzwords that we need to hear. Yeah. And I think with the bottom one, the, the prompts that you would have got would have been probably differentiated between a PFO and an ASD, mm -hmm. between picking up the shunts between the left and the right and the right to the left, mm -hmm. and then picking up about the negative contrast. And that's what we're doing that bottom study for and what you should be able to see on there. But yeah. you know, in there, I think the, the right to left shunt would be in as well. Um, so probably would have been a pass, but it might not have been a pass pass. It would probably be a borderline yeah, pass. Yeah. Um, and Marie. Can you critically analyze this image, please? Um, so it's a transthoracic image. It's subcostal imaging of the hepatic vein. Um, it's showing there is forward antegrade flow and systolic retrograde flow uh, into the hepatic vein. So it would be consistent with severe TR, perhaps? Or nice. And what about the actual imaging? Can you tell me a little bit more about the imaging? Do you trust this picture? Obviously, I'm not meant to. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you're okay. I mean, you're absolutely right with the systolic flow reversal. But what is it? There's, there's something dodgy about this picture, right? So when I say critically analyze it, just tell me how you can make this picture better. And again, I'm going to ask you to have a good look at this top picture here. Don't forget to look at everything in the screen. Oh, do you mean the spectral? So you want me to optimize the spectral profile? Absolutely. Just critically analyze this picture. So okay. can you trust this picture? You said it's systolic flow reversal. I think that's hard to fake. But just yeah. critically analyze it because it's not great, is it? I think if we had a chance no, to... The, the spectral profile should occupy at least two thirds yeah. of the screen. So you'd want to decrease the scale. Yeah. Um, um, and on the 2D image, you could optimize it as well and um, have color to make sure that you could see um, that you could align your um, sample volume, make sure that you're in the IVC and not the aorta. I mean, it's pretty clear, but color could help you. Fantastic. So is, uh, is this pulse wave or continuous wave Doppler? This is pulse wave Doppler. And how many this gates do you normally volume. have in a pulse wave Doppler picture? Oh, one. You've got three. So you've got high pulse repetition frequency. Thank you very much. So how do you avoid that? You can change the transducer frequency. Yep. You can use a higher frequency transducer. You can decrease the depth of the original 2D image. Very nice. So um, I guess they, you know, there won't be too many of these critically appraised ones, but I, I do love them because I think they're important clinically. Um, so just remember, if we are asking to critically appraise something, just and it's just, just don't forget to look at the number of gates that are on the on the picture at the top, okay? Yeah, thank cool. you. All right, back to you, Sid. Um, okay, the, this is, again, from my favorite journal in the world. I think this is the one case that was left over from last week. Again, I apologize, I wasn't able to be there. Um, okay, so this is case number one. We have a 49-year-old male with left upper quadrant abdominal pain for three days. Background history of a mitral valve surgery 20 years ago, AF, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. They've recently stopped all their medications, including warfarin. Okay. I think in the exam, actually, the examiner doesn't read it out. Sorry, I'm being silly there. I give you a chance. If you want to read it out loud, you're more than welcome, or just read it yourself. And whenever you're ready, you have, you're in charge of the, the PowerPoint presentation at your end. So then whenever you're ready, mark it forward. If you take too long, the examiner will hurry you up. So what type of valve is this and what do you see? This is a transthoracic um, image with extreme depths uh, showing the parasonal long axis view, showing the um, right, right ventricle looks um, enlarged. The left ventricle seems to be um, contracting normally. Um, I can't see the mitral well very clearly, and I would want to change the depth of the um, image to see it. Um, I can see the aortic valve although, um, and the leaflet excursion looks normal to me. Um, 
I would want to reduce the depth of this image to assess and, and focus a bit more on the mitral valve to assess the mitral valve leaflets. But it seems like a, a mechanical mitral valve leaflet uh, with all the um, kind of uh, reverberation artifact behind it. Very nice, excellent. Yes, so it's a mechanical mitral valve replacement. Uh, is there anything else that's unusual about this image? Yeah, there is possibly a mirror artifact behind this image, but, but I would want to confirm it in a different view to see um, what it is, because uh, I'm a bit concerned about that uh, ecogenic um, mass or material within that cavity behind the aorta, whether it is a left atrium or whether it is a some kind of artifact. Very nice. Okay, so we're going to move on to transesophageal echo. So transesophageal echo, um, uh, I mean, at the commissional level, um, or the 2D, sorry, 2D level, um, showing a, a smoky appearance. Again, first the mitral valve, it is a mechanical mitral leaflet, by bi leaflet valve, um, with significant artifacts behind it, occupying whole of the left ventricular cavity. And uh, the most striking feature is the, is the spontaneous echo contrast along with a, along with a very rounded um, echogenic, um, mass within the left atrium um, uh, with various differentials around it. So give me the differentials. So this is again 3D image showing on the, on the upper right. Um, and, uh, and at the bottom, there is a right ventricular focus, um, the view um, showing um, again that spontaneous echo contrast and possibly um, thrombus, free floating thrombus within the uh, left atrium. Uh, thrombus because it is, um, it is, uh, and along with the significantly raised left atrial pressures as indicated by the bowing of the interatrial septum and, and to the right atrium. Um, however, commenting on the, onto this, um, on the, onto this uh, echogenic material within the left atrium, um, it seems to be uh, on this view specifically, not independently mobile, um, though um, the frame rate is a bit low on this one. Um, As I said, I've just done my uh, ASC exams and in there I learned a lot about atrial myxomas, how they're normally in the left atrium, they're spherical, they can be huge. Uh, you know, I had a question like this in my ASC exams, surely that's a left atrial myxoma. Why is that, why is thrombus, uh, why is thrombus so differential? Oh, it's not, I mean, usually myxomas are linked with this talk uh, to the wall, which I can't see on this one. But again, I need to explore this further in various kind of um, up and down and go through or across the left atrium. Yes, myxoma is one of the differentials into it. Yeah, good man. I guess, I, I think you're absolutely right. And maybe just um, the, because obviously I think, yeah, myxomas have been a differential. You know, we'd ask you the differential list, but it's great to see you put thrombus right at the top. I was just trying to push you a little bit. And I'd have just said that based on that clinical story of with that valve, you said it was normal LV function, but I, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent convinced on that. If I can come back to this one, this one, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that that septum's doing a lot. I don't think the LV function is great. We do clearly have raised left atrial pressure. You picked that up beautifully with that intraatrial septum bow to the right. I think we see that LV function's a bit rubbish. You've got a mechanical mitral valve. You've got lots of sec in there, even coming off that. Um, and being off warfarin, I'd have thought, you know, you've got three pretty strong factors there pushing you down to the thrombus route. Um, and we didn't fool you at all, because this was definitely a thrombus, not a myxoma, but just like you said, it's in there in the differential, but you'd be concerned about thrombus at the top. Nicely done. Um, Hatim, you're here. Good morning. Uh, oh, good morning. Good afternoon. Are you happy to do the next one? Yeah, of course. Cool. Hi, welcome. Okay, so case two, you've got a 49-year-old female, short of breath, chest pain, and back pain. She's a refugee. She's coming to ED uh, with borderline saturations. ECGs, minor abnormalities, and some uh, pulmonary edema. Okay? Yes. Personal lung access view and the, uh, showing uh, interceptor wall and the infralateral wall, both of them are contracting well. Uh, the LV cavity size and the RB cavity, both of them are within normal ranges. Mitral valve is thickened, uh, at least in this view and with mild to moderate 
left atrial dilatation, uh, aortic valve looks normal in structure in this view. So, give me one uh, thing about the mitral valve. Can I just ask you to tell me about the mitral valve yeah. a bit more? So, mitral valve here, the posterior mitral valve leaflet uh, toward the tip is quite thickened, and uh, that would be, uh, I would have my differential diagnosis would be uh, aromatic heart disease uh, or myxomatous disease of the mitral valve. Excellent. So, color flow Doppler eccentric mitral valve uh, regurgitation. Uh, I would say moderate from this view, but I would like to check the vena contracta, the flow conversions uh, on slow images, and uh, it's posterior directed, so likely that would be consistent with mitral, uh, rheumatic mitral valve disease. Anything and there about is, the inflow? There, there is an inflow, uh, there is a candle-like uh, appearance of the flow. Uh, again, I would like to check the gradients, but that would be consistent with mitral valve stenosis. So color flow, apical four chamber view uh, across the mitral inflow, and uh, that's again consistent with uh, markedly increased uh, turbulence uh, across the, uh, the mitral valve. That would be consistent with uh, moderate severe mitral stenosis, but I would like to check the pressure half time and the continuous wave uh, flow Doppler across it. Uh, what walls do you have? Um, so here, here, yeah, sorry, yeah. So LV cavity size looks normal, and uh, function again, uh, ejection fraction will be fifty-five to sixty percent. I can see the anterolateral and infraceptal walls. Now, tell me what these images tell you. So that's a continuous wave Doppler at the level of the mitral valve, and that would be. I cannot see the numbers clearly, but here I can see that the pressure half time is quite. Uh, uh, deep slope, so that would be consistent. And again, I can see the mean gradient here of 10.5, so that would be consistent with severe mitral valve stenosis. On the other image, I can see the saturation time and the pressure half time, and that would be all consistent with the severity. So how would you further assess the severity of the mitral valves? So uh, I can check the, uh, the valve area uh, on uh, planimetry on the, uh, on, on the short axis view. I can do a tool uh, to confirm these findings and whether find out whether there is any other uh, deformity that I would uh, be able to uh, identify. Uh, I think, and I can do, uh, again, I can, uh, there was an, a, a mixed mitral valve disease associated with the mitral valve regurgitation, so it would be difficult yeah. to do uh, uh, pulse wave Doppler uh, assays to estimate the flow, but I can compare still the flow across the VTI across the mitral valve compared to the LVOT. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Uh, nicely done, that's very good, very good. Uh, ben, case number three, 70 year old man, short of breath and exertion, pulmonary edema. Okay, so parasternal long axis view on a transrhotic echo. The most striking findings are significantly dilated left atrium and what appears to be at least prolapse, if not flail of the posterior mitral valve leaflet. The left ventricle uh, from the segments that I can see appear to be contracting normally. Um, and again, the aortic valve appears to be opening normally. The right ventricle looks to be relative normal size. Nice. What's, um, uh, what walls are we looking at on the... Uh, on so the that's the anterolateral and, sorry, anteroseptal and infralateral wall. Good job. Uh, I'm going to show you a color Doppler profile next. What do you expect to see? Uh, I expect to see posteriorly direct, uh, sorry, I expect to see mitral vegetation, uh, which may be central or may be directed towards the anterior aspect of the, of the left atrium. Depending I'm, not, I'm not going to show you, sorry, I was going to show it to you and then I took it out. Sorry, no, very good. All right, time to go with this. Then, then I'm going to show you color Doppler and tell me what you're going to see. So, Apical four chamber, the walls are uh, anterolateral and infraceptal. Again, what I can see here is consistent with the previous clip, which is uh, probably flail actually of the posterior mitral valve leaflet. Um, and here I'd expect to see a broad regurgitant jet um, directed towards the interatrial inter septum. Um, how do you tell the difference between prolapse and flail? 
So it depends where you sl I slow it down uh, and look at it ideally at a zoom view and uh, at maximum posterior excursion of the leaflet where the uh, tip is pointing. So if it's pointing posteriorly uh, into the atrium, then it's flail. If it's still holding its shape and pointing into the ventricle, um, then it's more of a prolapse. You can also measure the excursion of a straight line. Good. Um, so, and tell me about severity on this very dodgy image. Yeah, so- uh, the, you try and use it, yeah. There are multiple features uh, on this study that make me think this is severe posterior, so severe mitral regurgitation. Um, given that the jet is eccentric, you have a coanda effect, so assessing the color Doppler uh, volume uh, of the regurgitant jet uh, is difficult to do, and you can also have um, flow into only limited pulmonary veins rather than all of them. The flow convergence appears broad, the vena contractor will be broad. Um, yeah. <laughs> What do you like to do next? Uh, in this patient, I'd like to uh, complete assessment of the transtracic echo. Um, they're short of breath and they've got pulmonary edema. So managing that is key because uh, we need to make sure that they're alive to start with. So make sure that they're oxygenated appropriately. Um, I'd look to get uh, ideally rate control if they were, I think they're a bit faster. I can't remember their rate, but um, it's to slow the heart rate down. Uh, and in the setting of uh, severe, presumably relatively acute onset mitral regurgitation, uh, they need further investigation, which may include, for example, coronary angiography. Uh, and then- else? Sorry? Any, any other investigations you'd like? Uh, uh, coronary angiography? Uh, so transesophageal oh. can be used- Oh, excellent, what a great question. Tell me about um, tell, me, tell me about what you think now about prolapse versus flare. Yeah, sure. Uh, so in this mesophageal four chamber, five, sorry, five chamber view, this looks more like prolapse. Whilst the uh, the posterior leaflet is moving quite a fair amount into the left atrium, the tip of it, which appears rounded and thick end, is still pointing towards the left ventricle. So, uh, so you think it's prolapse or flare? Do you say? So I am calling this prolapse. Fantastic. And tell me what leaflets we're looking at. Leaflets or scallops? A scallop, excuse me. So this well, is- Don't answer back to the examiner. <laughs> <laughs> leaflets, easy. Posterior and anterior leaflets. Next stage, please. <laughs> Absolutely, what scallops are they? Uh, so this is, look, this is probably P2A2. This can be P1A1, given that I can see some of the uh, left entry, left left right aortic valve, which might be higher in the esophagus. Um, ben, I'm going to switch over to Emma because I've just suddenly realised that she is also sitting in the DDU and she's also sitting next door to me and I've been ignoring her for the last half an hour. So if it's okay with you, we're going to move on to Emma now. So Emma, so take us through. So we've got a P2 prolapse. Can you tell me what we're looking at here and give you some sodium findings? It's a P2 prolapse. It looks like very mixed as well. I'd be you know, concerned that this is um, like a bar loss type uh, valve. What we can see with color Doppler is uh, flow convergence. It's large, the vena contractor looks large, it's terribly eccentric um, with the kind of effect, it's horseshoe or severe. What's this and what's it telling us? The PISA, PISA radius is more than one. And what does PISA stand for? Uh, it's the proximal isovolosity surface area. It's the, the, as you come towards a narrowing, the hemispheres. Um, will have altering velocities and based on that you can calculate radius and then uh, regurgitant um, and then flow and then you can work out the effect of regurgitant and flow of this area and then work out regurgitant uh, flow and function. Yeah so what's uh, do you trust this image? No, so what are the limitations of this image? So with yours so it assumes a hemispheric jet so that yeah. those hemispheric um, just, uh, jet lesions um, it's funnel shaped, so you need to angle correct for stenosis, not so much with regurg. Um, with eccentric jets, it's difficult, but you can still use these with eccentric jets. Um, I don't use it in my daily practice. I think it's got a place. Um, and that's the reason. The only thing I'd add is they also consume it's 180 degrees, and this one clearly isn't. Yes. Yeah, cool. Fair uh, I might just let Emma do the next one as well, please, if that's okay. Uh, 25 year old male, no past medical history or significant family history, no booze or drug use. Three month history of shortness of breath, acutely worsening over three days. You get pitting edema to the thighs, hypoxic with scattered basal creps. It was referred to the diagnosis of query pneumonia requiring NIV. Okay, so parastenal long axis showing um, pulmonary edema, pulmonary edema, 
normal thickness of the LV walls, perhaps slightly, perhaps slightly thickened, uh, severe LV systolic dysfunction. Um, the valves that produce the valve looks a bit thickened, I think, because of the, the 2D gain. Um, there looks like there is a left side of the valve here. There's some that looks like dynamic hair on the turns. The RV looks a little more generous, as does the left atrium. Are you not suggesting perhaps a chronic process that fits with history three with history shows? Again, just look at that. So he's tachycardic, probably trying to compensate for his low stroke volume. Um, his left ventricle is it's not dilated. Um, walls are preserved in their thickness, but it's got severe LV systolic dysfunction. VF is about 15 to 20%, I would say. Um, he's got severe, it looks like he's got significant diastolic dysfunction, also the you know, the medial lateral amulets are hardly moving. Um, we want to know what his left atrial pressure is out to account for that for routine, but the right side looks normal in size, actually, with reasonable longitudinal function. We can't see the free wall. Are there any reasonable motion abnormalities? Yeah, I mean, so we're looking at antralateral and intraseptal. So the antralateral is you know, the, the, the base in the mid, um, and the apical is either going to be LAD or circumflex. Your apex is going to be LAD. That mid intraseptum can be LAD or RCA, and that base in the interceptum is going to be RCA. Okay, so you're talking about diastolic dysfunction. What's this image, and what other images do you want? So, the diastolic. The diastolic function. So we're looking at the pulse wave doctor of the mitral inflow. It looks like it's on the tips of the mitral inflow. Um, we have got some fusion, I think, um, of the E and the A wave with the tachycardia, probably. Um, didn't look like there's any terrible mitral stenosis, so I presume it's from that. Um, it's a high E velocity, and I suspect based on the 2D, he's not going to have much reserve. So I think his LB relaxation is terrible. So I think his E to the be really what uh, other images do you want to try to look at? So, I would like tissue doctor, the medial natural angli. I would like the Navi, the TRV Max. Um, I don't mean the isobolic metric relaxation type of um, Yeah, so I mean, as expected with that 2D appearance, the inclines are around five for the septal, five for the lateral. I guess constrictive periglottitis would be something, but there was no paradox of the septal motion, there's no angulus reverses. It seems like it's got a restrictive cardiomyopathy of some description with preserved, you know, sort of wall thickness or even increased wall thickness with a restrictive filling pattern, although we can't really see the airwave to comment on that too much. And his TR velocity is more than 2.8. Um, if you've asked for the labby, what's the number that you've got for the left atrial volume index as the cutter? Very much indeed. Um, Anne Marie, very nice. You've awesome. smashed it. Anne Marie, this one's for you. Um, uh, I can't remember how old this patient was. Let's Probably they weren't very old. I think they were in their 50s. Brought in by ambulance from home, moribund, unrecordable blood pressure, intubated, and resuscitation was underway. High, nor high dose noradrenaline requirements were given, and he was hypoglycemic, and hence we did an echo. Oh, sorry, we did a blood gas burst, which goes <laughs> horrific acidosis. Sorry, uh, it's, it's, yes, I remember the patient history and examination first. And investigations, and then we do an echo. Uh, lactates of 4.1, so uh, bicarbs 15, so a severe metabolic acidosis. Okay, so we've got a trans thoracic image of a peristernal long axis view, um, slightly off axis, as we've not got much of the left ventricle, we've got most of the left atrium. Uh, the left atrium. Um, I'm just trying to check if he, is, he does have a cardiac output. He's not having CPR. But... <laughs> <laughs> the left ventricle's dilated. Um, the uh, mitral valve leaflets are barely opening. There's a significant E point septal separation, which would be consistent with a poor stroke volume. Um, it, I can't see much of the left ventricle, but I'd be uh, estimating the overall ejection fraction to be very poor based on those images of the region of 10 to 20 percent. Um, the right fine. ventricle looks dilated. Oh, sorry, actually, I, this, was, this, was, this was the one I was going to say. Excellent. So I'm going to, the next image I'm going to show you is going to be a colour Doppler image. What do you expect to see on that colour Doppler image? I've already seen it. So significant um, <laughs> uh, mitral regurg, basically free mitral regurg, just the leaflets aren't co-opting. Thank you. Uh, so and you call it severe. Are there any other features that tell you it's severe on this other than the 2D features? 
um, well, it occupies the entire left atrium, which is dilated, so the jet area relative to the left yeah. atrium size. That's good. Okay, now talk about the short axis view, please. Um, so there's the anterior mitral leaflet on top, and then the posterior, there's some um, mitral annular calcification, quite a significant amount. And again, there's a corruption defect clearly visible um, in, uh, they don't completely oppose, the right ventricle is dilated, the myocardium is thinned, and this looks like it's a chronic process rather than acute process, whatever. Um, and there's a trace pericardial effusion inferiorly at the, in, at the in, inferior wall. Can you tell me a little bit more about the septum, please? Uh, so the septum is bowing. I need to slow it down to time it completely, but it bows from left to right, but it's mainly distended from um, with right. I think there's elevated right-sided pressures, but I can't be sure if it's systolic or diastolic bowing because of the- Let's say it's going through mainly during diastole. So if it's diastolic, that would be suggestive of volume overload in the right ventricle. Anything else you think is abnormal in the ventricle? Sorry, I'll you. The, fun the overall function is terrible. 100%. Um, um, and it's very thin walled. Uh, anything else in the left ventricle lumen? Left ventricle lumen. I don't know what. That's okay. I was meaning this over here in the look just by the uh, just by the posterior leaflet, just by P1. The mitral annular calcification here. There's mitral annular calcification. What does mitral annular calcification look like? Because I think you're probably right, but I. Are you talking about this? Oh. Yes. Okay, excuse me, I thought you were talking about this, this sort of edge artifact is what I was talking about for me. So I don't think there's a great deal of mitral annular calcification. What else could this be? What else would this be on a differential? Uh, so in any maths on a valve, you'd be thinking infection, thrombus, uh, tumour. Um, oh. Right. So on the top image is now an apical, <laughs> an apical <laughs> four chamber, and it looks like there's a mass attached to the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Um, it's on the uh, downstream side, which would go against endocarditis, um, but not exclusively. It would be more in keeping with a, a papillary fibroelastoma or some other sort of tumour. Um, or again, thrombus would have to be in the differential because of the low cardiac output state and the poor function. Very nice. And the bottom right image, just take me through that again. Uh, so again, just severe um, mitral regurgitation with a significant um, flow conversion zone. And uh, uh, I'd have to slow it down, but it looks like there'd be a vena contractor that would be consistent with the uh, severe mitral regurgitation. And the downstream jet occupies most of the left atrium. If you had to critically appraise the image, is there anything else that um, I've completely balls up? Which one, sorry? Which image? You had to critically appraise this image. Is there anything in there which would show that the person who did the imaging uh, didn't do a brilliant job? Yeah, your Nyquist limit is set too low. It should be imaged between 50 and 70. And so you'll be overestimating the severity of the mitral regurgitation. So purely from an interest point of view, I thought I'd show you these. So this, this patient didn't do very well. Um, and just from an interest point of view, I thought with the horrible congestion that we've got in there, this is what, first of all, a nutmeg liver looks like. You can see it's huge, you know, the size of the livers, and that's a sign of sort of chronic congestion of the liver, an ischemic dusky bowel all the way through it. This is what it looks like on autopsy. Um, a big heart uh, was in there, and it was all thrombus. You can see sort of some of the thrombus that's here in the left ventricle that he's cut open here, and that was likely there's some chronic thrombus in the top in the apex, as well as in the base of the ventricle in there, and there's sort of just so lots of congealed chronic sort of uh, thrombus that was sitting all the way through it, and uh, this is pretty obvious. Hmm? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, excellent. Who's next? Uh, Hatem, I think it's you next. Um, oh, actually, sorry. Can I give this one to Emma? I put this in particularly for Emma. Um, go for it. Case number six. All right. A youngish man collapsed IVDU. 
low GCS and high cointensive. Pulseless on examination. EA. I mean, there's peri the immediate thing that jumps out if this was an arrest situation would be the pericardial fluid with echogenic material in it with a massively dilated aortic root, and I'd be worried about dissection. <laughs> Again, I mean, needs urgent cardiovascular. I mean, the good, sorry, the left ventricular function looks now preserved. I presume we've had some adrenaline or something. Um, and then there's no, no, not at this stage, he's still, still pulse, pulseless on exam. Okay. Um, and he's got what looks like thickened ventricle with preserved systolic function, but you might have some pseudo hypertrophy. But um, I, I'm worried about that aortic root and the pericardial fluid with the echogenic stuff. It's healing pericardial into the fluid. Nice. What, are you, what are you going to do? What's your? Um... I mean, we had yes. So, I mean, in this situation, you're, you're nowhere near a cardiothoracic surgeon. You've got to drain it, right? You've got to do pericardial Okay, so we drained the effusion. He didn't die. It was uh, so. This is the guy that was so pulses on examination. He was on like, I think they were giving him, you know, adrenaline boluses, and he was on noradrenaline already. He was grey, pulseless, and we must have taken out maybe literally like 10 mils of fluid or 15 mils of fluid and literally the guy just sat up almost it was like <gasps> you know it was phenomenal and then we had to hold him down and space him and then we did the toe so what does this show um so we've got two images one of the uh, the aortic valve short axis um in the sort of mid esophageal view it's got her in like awful looking eccentric ar i'd be worried that that dissection flap had gone down um, and caused aortic regurg. There's different mechanisms by which you could, dissection can cause aortic regurg. And then we've got um, obviously the aortic valve and ascending aorta in one axis view. There's an awful looking intramural hematoma. It looks thickened, that aortic, the anterior aortic root looks thickened. Maybe it's dissected through. I can't see an obvious mobile dissection flap. Um, and that aortic valve looks looks abnormal, I'd want to interrogate that more for sure, but I'd be worried about things prolapsing down um, and disruption of that, um, you know, the annulus of the aortic valve. Can you tell me through that, um, can you point out the cusps of the aortic valve? Okay, so we've got, I mean, this one's hardly moving at all. This is the right uh, coronary cusp, and then this one's mm -hmm. either the non or the left. How about on the short axis? On the short axis, I mean, you could, you could, you could argue that that might be might be a bicuspid valve, right. and that's probably yeah. a risk factor for dissecting. Yeah. Okay. Take me through the descending aorta. I mean, just awful intramural thrombus. Um, really thickened again. I can't see a, an obvious mobile. I think that's artifact for dissection flap, but it looks like a, um, you know, an intramural hematoma um, yeah. on this one. I think that's the dissection flap here. Um, it's really interesting. This is the false lumen, I think, and that's the true lumen. I oh, know that's pulse. Yeah, no, I think that's it's interesting because that's pulsatile and expansile, and this one's not moving too much. But I think that's probably the dissection flap. It's hard to tell, and then it's it's gone outside. It's, it's gone outside. It's perforated through that. About the size of the aorta, you saw, previously talked about the size of the aorta. It's huge. I mean, yes, there's one, a massive two, aorta. Three, is that normal in a five. dissection? No, so I suspect he's got a bicuspid valve and aortopathy. Yeah, that is nice. underlying and then he's dissected. Yeah, and where's the dissection come from? Does that look like a normal dissection? No, flat? it's come no. from an intramural hematoma. So he's probably had. He's probably had probably. I mean, it's hard to see, but like a subacute dissection that's been contained. Okay. And then it's I don't know what else I've given so this is an this is this is someone who's had an aortitis. So he's got an aortopathy underlying it. And he's yeah. an IV drug user, and he it's had a, he had horrific infection. I cannot remember what the bug was, but it wasn't salmonella and it wasn't syphilis. And this is an ulcer. 
so this is similar to the case that we Emma and I had a couple of days ago where you've got this massive ulcer that's then eroded and the dissection has come down through the plane. But through you and the, then out through there. Yeah, and I think the big thing for me, and this wouldn't be in the DDU as a pass or fail, I think everything you said would be a would be a pass, but it's the the wall could be a hematoma, but it looks like it's almost quite eccentric for me. You know, I think this not that wall, but we're seeing it in the we're seeing it in the descending aorta. We're seeing it yeah. in the ascending aorta. We're seeing this massive, thick, uh, massive, thick walls, which suggests inflammation or infection to me. And then with this ulcer that looks just bloody awful, there must have been some blood that's tracked down. And I think with the dilated ascending aorta, I think we can see that there's pulsatile flow in there. I think that's probably it's just a, a, a no. I, I think that's probably a pulmonary artery or in there. Okay. I think maybe, and because I'm still sitting up around the ascending aorta region. And I think that's what you were seeing there was the pulmonary artery behind it. Oh, we can just see coming off there. Yeah. Yeah. So they thought this was an aneurysm. We've got a pseudo aneurysm that's in there, probably from an ulcer collapse associated with uh, the hemopericardium. And this guy, as you said, needs urgent cardiac surgery. We managed to stabilize him with a needle sticking, sitting in his chest. Uh, so we took out a little bit of fluid and then closed it off, hoping that his blood volume wasn't going to fall onto his feet. And then we, we transferred him down in an ambulance and sort of said to the guys, you know, best of luck. It was just to, I think it was a paramedic and an ED junior doctor. And we said, just if he becomes pulseless again, just open up the three-way tap that we stuck on the end of his pericardial drain. And he had an emergency ventils and did well and came back to us six days later off ironotropes. Amazingly, everything went well. And he was discharged to the ward a couple of days later, but he did steal his nurse's wallet. So uh, I think that was, that was a win. We kept another... IVDU, yeah, yeah. uh, got him back on the streets within a week. It was excellent. Nice. Uh, you're right. I think there was definitely infection that we found on blood cultures a little bit later. But you're right. Um, um, that's that's it, guys. I guess that's time. I uh, just want to wish you all the very, very best of luck with your exams. I'll say again, I think all of your knowledge is absolutely fantastic. Just stay calm on the day, answer the questions. The examiners will take you through it in a relatively rapid pace or so similar to the pace that I was doing it today. Just trying to sort of push you through it and don't be uh, deterred by that. Just kind of go with the flow a little bit. Um, say what you see, keep it, you know, keep it clinically relevant, keep it fast, relatively fast paced um, and at quite a high level of discussion, just like you've been doing today. That's exactly what's required. Um, and, I, and again, I just wish you all the very, very best of luck, okay? If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter, at Echo Nepean, and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.